Good evening. Welcome back. It's time for a pastor's Bible study. Welcome to St. Matthew African Methodist Episcopal Church of Orange, New Jersey. Here, we will journey through the sacred text together. Grab your Bible. Everyone is invited. No matter where you are in knowledge, you are welcome here. Come grow in faith with our pastor, the Reverend Melvin E. Wilson, our pastor teacher. Our pastor is excited. Pastor is ready, ready to increase your knowledge and faith as we discover that the Bible is black history. Ready, set, let's go. Good evening, everybody. God bless you. Welcome to our Tuesday night Bible study. So glad to see everyone here. Hope you had a safe day navigating through this weather. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We praise you for this day and the privilege you give us to gather tonight for this Bible study. We ask your blessing upon us in these next several moments. Thank you for every person who is logging on from wherever they're logging from. Touch them and anoint them. Open up their hearts and minds so that we might receive this information. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you. Good to see everybody tonight. Uh, you can go to either the website and get the outline for tonight. I'm also dropping it in the chat, and you can download it from the chat. Um, and uh, tonight we, we're going to do uh, two things. Number one. Uh, Reverend Dr. Donna Hoshing is going to lead us because I messed up last week and she was supposed to teach last week. So I messed up. So she's going to teach uh, tonight. Uh, we're coming to the conclusion of our study on the Bible is black history. So after she does her teaching moment, I will come back at the end and give us a summary uh, I'll provide a summary of the study that we've been involved in for the last two or three months. In the outline, you see both the outline that Reverend Dr. Donna prepared, as well as the outline that I prepared. So it's a combination outline, several pages that you'll be able to look at and hopefully follow along. So without further ado, I give you our ministerial chief of staff, Reverend Dr. Donna Ho Shing. Yes, unmute, Reverend Dr. Donna. There you go. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> I um I was excited about last week because I thought it was such an interesting um topic. 
Um, but you know, you stole my thunder, so that's okay. Um, but Sorry. tonight we're gonna um go into the last chapter of the book, and we're looking into um as a, as the chapter says, a challenge to God's chosen people. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can I be allowed? Okay. Let's see where I find it. Okay. Maybe it's this one. Yeah, I think it's this one. Can you all see it? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Thank, yes. thank you so much. Yes, we can see it. Great. Okay, so um, welcome to anyone who is new. <laughs> and welcome back to those who were with us last week and for those who have traveled with Pastor through this book with some interesting guests that we have had um, who shed some light on some of the things that um, that are going on with um, God's chosen people and, you know, in reference to um, whether or not... Mm, um, the the chosen people were originally black from what we have heard and from what we have read from what was taught to us we know that um okay hold on a minute something i, I must have touched something hold on mm. okay mm. Give me one quick second. <laughs> okay. I am sharing my screen, but this is not the screen I want to share. Sorry about that. So let me go back to sharing my screen. I think I touched something that I shouldn't have touched. Okay. All right. So what I wanted to say to talk about, um, starting from page 147, if you all have your books, and the author was talking about um, what happens when, you know, my interpretation of it is what happens when God's people, God's chosen people stray from God. And you can see here, God really wants them to return to him. And he waits with open arms for their return. And even us as Christians, um, we know that if we mess up, that's the reason Jesus died, right? We mess up, we can go straight to, you know, our knees or no matter, we might be driving, we can say, God, forgive me. And, Excuse you know, me. God Excuse is me, waiting. Excuse me, Reverend Donna, we don't yeah. see your eyes. You don't? No. Oh. I'm sharing my screen. Let me stop sharing and let me try again. Okay. And share. Can you see it now? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so what happens when God's um, chosen people stray from God? Um, God is always willing to forgive. You know, um, when we when when it's when it's communion time, and we say some of the um, collects, we talk about God's willingness to forgive us of our sins, right? And so God wants um, His chosen people to return to Him, and He waits for them with open arms. Just think, if you can remember, the story of the two brothers 
Um, and one brother asked for his inheritance and he left and went and squandered it. And he was eating, you know, well, he longed to eat what the pigs ate. I think he ate, you know, from the pig pen. But he said, why should I do this? You know, my father has, you know, so much more that I can go and just, maybe I'll just go and ask for forgiveness. And before he even got to the house, the father was running towards him with open arms. So that's the story of Jesus and us or his chosen people, right? So what are the characteristics of God's chosen people? If you look at the Bible and you read through um, a lot of the Old Testament, you will see that God's chosen people were stiff-necked and stubborn. Okay? They always wanted to do what they wanted to do. And I thought of myself um, in, in that light that sometimes I want to do what I want to do and I want to do it when I want to do it. And I don't want anybody to tell me otherwise. And it, it, it kind of spoke to me and, you know, say how, how prideful I am. And I, I just need to check myself. But God's, um, another characteristic of God's chosen people is that they're easily seduced by surrounding communities. Um, they e they're easy to adopt the ways of their surrounding communities and forget about their own. What, what are the tenets and the practices that God um, has told them to engage in? They leave that and they quickly latch on to um, what they know isn't right, but they're going to do it uh, because they're going to do it and nobody's going to tell them otherwise, right? So really, that was a characteristic or of God's chosen people, if you read the Bible. Now, the Igbos of Nigeria, remember... Um, Back, um, maybe chapter three, I think it was, when we talked about the Igbos of Nigeria, that they um, they are, and we talked about the fact that in Africa, there are more descendants or more um, descendants of the Jews or, or practicing um, Jews in Africa than anywhere else in the world. OK, so the Igbos of Nigeria um, practice Jews, Judaism. They see themselves as the as the descendants of Israel and they practice Judaism long before Christianity was introduced. Wait, wait, wait. Was introduced. <laughs> So the principles of Judaism was passed down orally. And these principles make them descendants of the biblical Hebrews. They didn't have any, um, any um, writings or anything like that. So um, the, the writer um, is supposing that this was passed down orally. You know, you you tell the story of what happened or you tell the story of what God wants you to do as a Jew. And so they they pass that down um, through the years. And so they were still practicing the principles of Judaism um, without having a book or, you know, a, a some scroll to tell them what to do. And so in that light, um, we would say that they truly are the descendants of Israel. Now, some African-Americans are descendants of the Igbos or claim to be descendants of the Igbos, making them also descendants of the biblical Hebrews. Okay, so you should research yourself and see you might be, you might have some Igbo in you. You never know, right? But um, when the, the writer talks about the Hebrew people, 
um, and kind of when he talks about the Igbos and those that are living in America today, and he looks at Deuteronomy chapter 28. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Deuteronomy 28 because we're going to look at what this curse is about. Everybody has it, Deuteronomy 28. Ooh, God is so good. Okay. Now, Deuteronomy 28, I have a parallel Bible here. The People's Parallel Bible. So I have the New Living Translation and the King James Version. So I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation because that's what's in our textbook that we're studying from. And it says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world, and you will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction, but they will scatter from you in seven. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you in his holy, as his holy people, as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord, and they will stand in awe of you. And it goes on to talk about the prosperity that God would give them. But if you look, starting in verse 15, it says, but if you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all the commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come and overwhelm you. Okay. Now, this is a parallel, right? He talked about how the fields and the breadboards and all those things will be blessed. Now he comes in and says, your towns and your fields will be blessed, <laughs> will be cursed, sorry. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be cursed. The children, your, your children and your crops will be cursed. The offspring you herd and your her of herds and flocks will be cursed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be cursed. So how is this? How, what are we talking about here? When the writer says, you know, he, there's a parallel between, um, of all of what is being said in Deuteronomy 28 with what is happening or what has happened to African-Americans in this country. Okay. Now, he went on to talk about the fact that um, the Lord himself will send on you curses and confusion and frustration, okay? So I want to just parallel these two things. We are um, looking at the curse and the African-American experience, okay? So if you go down to verse 49, 
It says, the Lord will bring a distant nation against you from the end of the earth, and it will swoop down on you like a vulture. It is a nation whose language you do not understand. And the writer, you know, um, did some digging and said, well, it couldn't be all the things that the Israelites experience in their land. Because they knew the people who came against them. They knew the Assyrians. They knew about Bab Babyl the people in Babylonia. They knew about um, Rome. So those are not foreign to them. If those people attack them, that, you know, they're people who they, they know about. But the Lord said, if you fail to do what I say to you, the Lord will bring a distant nation against you from the end of the earth. And for the Igbos, America was a distant nation whose language they did not understand. Okay, follow me. The Lord will exile you. That's um, in verse 36. I know we're going back and forth in, in chapter 28, but this is how the writer looked at the um, African-American experience. Looking at some of the things that happened to the African-Americans and what is said in Deuteronomy 28. The Lord will exile you and your king to a nation unknown to you and your ancestors. So the Igbos and their leaders were more likely to be sold into slavery by other Africans, okay? The leaders weren't, um, uh, oh my goodness. Did you watch that show? The, the Woman King? You watch that show, The Woman King? And you saw it's actually a movie. Uh, we would have gone to see it at a movie if people went to the movies. It it hasn't gone on TV yet that I'm aware of. Oh, I watched it on TV. But yeah, yes, it is the Woman TV. King. Maybe I I don't know how I got to watch it. Maybe it was on um, what do you call it? Um, Netflix or one of those. But I watched it on TV, and I was so oh my gosh. Anyway. So you could see there how they would sell the um the the Africans and they would sell them to um the Europeans or the white men who who came to the port, right? They would be sold. So sometimes our people were captured and put into slavery, and there were times that other Africans actually sold them into their own people into slavery but the Igbos and their leaders were more likely than other Africans to be sold into slavery I'm not sure if the um I don't remember if the writer said why but um this is what happened then if we go to verse 22 the Lord will strike you with wasting diseases, fever and inflammation, with scorching heat and drought, and with blight and mildew. Oh my gosh. These disasters will pursue you until you die. Now, if we look at the African-American experience and the disparities in terms of the health disparities that um, are present, we will note that African-Americans have a great disparity with certain types of diseases. You think of heart disease, cancer, um, and all the, other, um, all the other diseases that our writer mentioned here. The worst diseases that afflict the United States population seem to affect the African-American community much more severely. He's not saying that nobody else um, was afflicted, but he's saying that it looks like when we look at the disparities in terms of health disparities, African-Americans suffer 
more than any other um, ethnic group. So you think of cancer, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, obesity, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, HIV, AIDS, um, autoimmune diseases, coronavirus, and deaths all disproportionately affect the African-American community. And I'm going to say this. So my, my career, my present career is a visiting nurse. And when I go and I see African-Americans, they have so many problems. It's you, when you look, the list of their diseases is a page and then you're, you're going down the page and just looking at so many things that they have. Almost everybody has high blood pressure. Almost everybody has heart failure. Almost everybody has some type of cancer or the other. And I'm talking men and women, okay? When I look at them, um, they're obese. They have asthma. They have COPD. These are just common things that I see with African-Americans that I, um, when I go to visit them in their home, okay? And um, okay, so African Americans, and I say black and brown people too. I say brown people, Pastor, because there's this um, this couple that I visit. Um, it's a wife who is sick, and every time I go there, before I leave, they want me to pray. <laughs> so I. I, I do ministry too. Sometimes I, you know, if if I divulge the fact that I'm a minister, then people want me to pray or whatever it is with them. But anyway, the Lord will strike you with these diseases. So you can name some of the diseases. I meant to ask you, can you name them? But And I went ahead and did it myself. This was supposed to be interactive. Can you think of anything else that I didn't name? that you see with um yes reverend leslie actually dr john i was going going back to when you were reading the scripture i think that it's important when we look at when we're looking um those of us who are looking at our bible that uh the curses actually come under uh it is and it has to be stated that is if you do not obey right God, Yes. If you don't obey him, everything right. that he was going to bless you with, if you decide and for free will here, if you don't do this, mm -hmm. then this is what's going to happen. Exactly. And I, and I just wanted to emphasize that earlier on. I forgot my hand was still up. Um, but <laughs> I the just obedience, saw it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Obedience versus disobedience. Right. Has to be really clear here. In, Thank in, you in, so as much, Reverend Leslie. Justice. You're absolutely right. So if we obey the Lord and do all that he commands us to do, then we will, we will reap blessings. But if we disobey him, not to say that if you're sick, it means that you disobeyed God. You, you're following me? It doesn't necessarily mean that because you're sick with something that you have been disobedient. Um, you know, um, I don't know the mind of God. I don't, I don't know how God works, but um, I just wanted to put that in there as well. So let's go to verse Wait, 43. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Dr. Dr. Hoshing. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm getting the, what what is the writer trying to say? Because that's what I was going to pick up. Okay, so this the writer is trying to say the writer is trying to say that um, Jewish people, and we're talking about descendants of Israel. Of Israel, um, when we look at the fact that we already established that they were black, am I right? And then we're establishing the fact that some of these people, especially the Igbos were those who would be sold more likely to be sold into slavery. And they were the ones who um, this Deuteronomy um, blessing and curse um, seemed to parallel with. 
when we talk about the disobedience of the people of Israel. So the Igbo see themselves as the descendants of Israel. So we're looking at that experience in America because they were brought, people from a distant land came and got them and took them um, to a country where they didn't understand the language. So we're looking at the fact that um, when, when we talk about Deuteronomy 28, and we're looking at the curse in Deuteronomy 28, and we're saying, well, how does that affect the Israelites? If we look at the African-American people, we can see parallels in some of the curses in Deuteronomy 28 with the African-American experience. And that is happening because the Igbos were brought to this country as slaves. So we're looking at the curse and looking as we finish this lesson, how we can, um, how we can make things better. Did I make it clearer? I'm sure. I mean, I don't know if I necessarily agree. I don't know. I'm just trying to follow what, uh, Okay. What All right. You, well, you can the, talk about what you don't agree with. Let me just finish this for one. Yeah, second. that's what I said. That's why I didn't. I just okay. That's good. I paused. So the laurels strike you with wasting diseases, fever, and inflammation, with scorching heat and drought, with blight and mildew. And we talked about that. Now we're going to the foreigners living among you will become stronger and stronger while you become weaker and weaker. They will lend money to you, but you will not lend to them. They will be the head and you will be the tail. And for African-American people, the Igbos, the descendants of the Igbos or the descendants of Israel, who are some African-Americans in this land today, European foreigners and their descendants are the ones with the money in this country who grow richer while the descendants of the Igbos grow poorer. If you look, and I think um, somebody mentioned last week that we are so heavily in debt as Black people. Who do we borrow from? Do we borrow from a bank who is owned by Blacks? Do you know any bank that is owned by Blacks today? You remember that, um, and help me, Pastor and, and Reverend Leslie, um, the, the, the state where Blacks were thriving and doing well. They had, they had banks. Oklahoma. Oklahoma? Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Right. And then, they, and then they burned it down. Okay. Because, because of course, you know, um, African, African Americans could not do so well and, you know, they become rich. So they burned everything down. And those people have, you know, they've tried to rebuild, but some just gave up. So European foreigners and their descendants were the ones. We, when we borrow money, we go into a bank. Most of these banks are owned by white people. Do we own a bank that white people come to borrow from? Do you know of any African-American owned bank that you see white people go in to borrow money from? There used to be, Reverend Dr. Donna, there used to be more black financial institutions uh, in Harlem when I passed it in Harlem. Uh, there was a bank called Freedom Savings Bank. Okay. They, they closed. Carver. We had Carver. I was getting ready to say Carver. Mm -hmm. uh, but even black banks, because they are not uh, heavily capitalized, Newark had City okay. National. National. Right. Because, uh, and Philadelphia had First United or United Bank of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, because, because banks are not. Uh, heavily capitalized, they have to uh, partner with larger banks 
in order to even do business. In fact, uh, what, what a lot of people didn't know about Carver is that Carver would have to clear anybody that had a checking account that wrote a check on a Carver account. It was cleared through Chase because mm -hmm. Carver didn't have enough business to have their own what's called the ACH system. True, so true. To, mm -hmm. to your point, to your point, um, it's a it's a plaque uh, economic part. But can I just make this one point, Reverend Dr. Yeah. Donna? Teaching, I, I I think the parallel that the author is using by lifting up Deuteronomy 28, Sister Cheryl, is uh, with, with the Igbos and, and, and all Black people is, the parallel is that the suffering that occurred, the suffering that occurred to Blacks historically is paralleled and that story is kind of told in the Deuteronomy 28 experience. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, it, it's, it's much deeper and much longer than that, but that's just one example mm -hmm. of the kind of sufferings that occurred to people of color uh, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, so it's not, I'm not, I'm taking it a different, I'm interpreting what, I was taking it literally saying, was it based because of sin? And there no, 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 that's no, what I, okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Rise above that. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the larger macro point, the macro point is what he what he uses. And he could have used several other chapters mm -hmm. in the yeah. Bible to show how uh, blacks, people of color, Africans have suffered under the hands of a controlling colonial uh, uh, society. Right. Some kind of government. Some kind of somebody who was not black or right. not which, African, is, which is why we're in the situation here. now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the point. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank Go you. ahead, Reverend. Thank you very much, um, Pastor, for clearing that up. That's why you're the pastor. <laughs> okay. You it says you will be engaged to a woman, but another man will sleep with her. You will build a house, but someone else will live in it. You will plant a vineyard, but you will never enjoy its fruit. And can anyone volunteer to explain how the, how slaves experienced these curses? And I said, think rape and cotton. Anybody? Did y'all read this the chapter? <clears throat> this yes? is Sister Hunter. Yes, Mr. Uh, Hunter. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, in terms of how slaves experience these curses, even in back in the day, in the chapter um, alludes to the fact that it didn't, the, the colonnades in Britain, when we, they, we were manufacturing tobacco, they stopped because they didn't have the people to do it. And then we started with the cotton and cotton was more aggressively uh, man manually had to take more time to do it. And since they it were had enslaved people, what they did is they used the slaves to um, produce the cotton, which made America a wealthy country. In terms of the rape, I think there's a quote from a lady in the chapter who speaks about that she was the um, image. They were talking about putting up an image of, right. of the Confederacy. And she said, I am the image. I was raped because mm -hmm. the slave owned masters would um, rape the women. And that's why we have all these different colors of people who look like us. Did th does that make sense? Yes. Thank you very much. Very good. You did, you did it right. great. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, verse 37 says, you will become an object of horror, ridicule, and mockery among all of the nations to which the Lord sends you. Wherever Igbos were sold into slavery, they were treated poorly. And if you look at Blacks all over the world um, who are not in Africa, um, most of the times um, when you look at their experience, it's the same. People might say, if we go to England, we're not treated that badly. Uh, that's not true. You know, they talk about out of Compton. 
you know, and, you know, they speak badly because, you know, black people live in Compton. Um, if you go to Amsterdam, same thing. Um, so wherever blacks go, okay, they're treated very poorly. All right. And we're in neighborhoods that, well, some blacks are in neighborhoods that are, you know, um, they have a lot of disparity in terms of um, health, wealth, um, and anything else you want to, you want to talk about. If, if fierce... I can, if, I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Dr. Don, if I can, uh -huh. I just want to make a, um, an observation that uh, we've, in in other countries, you've got two types of of black folks that we mm -hmm. really talk about. Okay. Um, you've got those that are native born to the land, mm -hmm. um, and then you have those who would be considered foreigners that come in. Mm -hmm. And so the the discrimination and the bigotry and all. Um, it, it, it is, uh, I'm not sure what word I'm trying to find, but you see it on both ends. You will see native born uh, persons of dark skin who will treat, just like we see in this country now with the immigrants. You do not mm. see some of the immigrants from these countries where um, we do not see people who are U.S. citizens who are associated with the immigrants that are coming into this country, mm -hmm. they're not being totally embraced um, mm -hmm. in the way in which you would think that they would be, um, yes. because they just they they don't they no longer um, identify in that way. So, in countries like like Amsterdam, you can even say um, like Paris, like France, like Italy, where you have dark skinned Italians, those persons. Um, would look at others who are coming in from other countries and are dark skinned, they are considered foreigners and not necessarily people who um, um, who would be, uh, who, who should be, uh, I don't want to say privileged, but who should uh, get a share of the, of the small pot that mm. is available, um, again, for the, for the native born. Right. Um, and I think also I re I'm remembering Ukraine when the war started in Ukraine, that um, um, blacks were being told they have to wait until they bust the other colored people, the the you know the lighter colored people out. Um, Absolutely, that's yes, right. Um, then it says in fifty, a fierce and heartless nation that shows no respect for the old. And no pity for the young. Not only during slavery, but even today, you will hear some white people refer to African Americans as boy or gal, or uh, or children are shot and handcuffed, and no apology is made if people are mistakenly identified, um, or identified is is that identified mistakenly? I I don't know. Wrongly identified, and then they realize that they may have the wrong person. Um, they may not apologize. You know, the 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 author tells of different instances where um things were done to children, and when they realized that, you know, those children weren't um who they were looking for, or you know, whatever it was, they just you know walked away and without saying sorry. But I remember um it, back in 2012, when I graduated from Rutgers with my doctorate, and I was walking back to the nursing department, and there was a white lady walking behind me, and I heard her say to her family member, like she would say, look, Karen, look at this gal. This gal got her PhD. You know, I almost turned around. I really almost turned around and forgot that I was in training at the Institute, Pastor. Um, but I said, you know what? Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to be better and I'm going to be good. And so I didn't I didn't do anything. Maybe I should have said something. Um, 
but she referred to me as the gal. And that was in 2012, you know? So I, I just wanted to, to, to just share that experience. So what is the remedy for these curses or these things that we're experiencing? How can we, how can we encourage African-Americans to be their better selves? In the future, when you experience all these blessings and curses, now this is from Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 3. So if you skip forward to Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 3, it says, in the future, when you experience all these blessings and curses I have listed for you, when you are living among the nations to which the Lord your God has exiled you, take to heart all these instructions. If at that time you and your children return to the Lord your God, and if you obey with all your heart and all your soul, all the commands I have given you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes. He will have mercy on you and gather you back from all the nations where he has scattered you. So what is, what is the remedy? First thing, repentance. Second thing, rededication. We need to rededicate ourselves to God, you know, and every time when we do um, at the end of preaching, when we give out that invitation, we talk about people, um, you know, three invitations, people who are repenting and they're giving their lives to God, people who are rededicating their lives to God. They may have gone out of the fold and God is still waiting with open arms. So we ask them to come back into the fold. And then we ask those who want to, if they want to join us as a church. But we want to discuss the truth about the Bible and God's chosen people. That they're not necessarily, um, that they were originally Black. Replace the false images of people in the Bible with images of Black people because that is who they were. Are there any other suggestions? How can we... How can we um, reap the blessings that God has for us? Sister Warren, you look as if you have something to talk about. Is that Sister Warren? No, that's not Sister Warren. I can't mm -hmm. even see. No, that's not Sister Warren, but I was saying, I was thinking to myself that one of the things we can do is live by his word, follow and live by his word. You know, we have to live our life accordingly. And right. you live your life by what others do or what you see others do. You have to you have to live by God's word, you know, and, and live accordingly. And sometimes people may not agree with you, or sometimes people will say, Oh, you're a holy roly. Or, or something like that, or you're a Bible told in person. But I don't think it's none of that. I just think that we, we as Christians, or me as a Christian, let me speak for myself, I have to live by his word in order for me to see the, man, the manifestation of where I'm trying to go. Very good. Well said. Anyone else has a thought about how we can... Um... How we can um, remedy the curse. And I think that's very simple, um, Sister Warren. You know, live, live the life that God has called you to live. And serve in the way that God has called you to serve. We all have a calling. Some of us just have different calling, but we all have a calling. Pastor, can I turn this over to you at this time? Yes, you can. Thank you so much. Can we put our hands together and thank Reverend Dr. Donna for Oh, her... you don't have to do that. 
leadership tonight. I know, but I'm saying it. So that's what I want to happen. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Donna. So I want to transition now into uh, doing the summary of the lesson. And this is about midway of your outline. Uh, Reverend Dr. Donna's outline was in the front part of the outline. So mine starts about midway. So I want to view, uh, review very quickly. Uh, what are some lessons that we have learned? doing this whole study. You remember we started this several months ago. Uh, we've It has been, I think, an eye-opening, uh, a wonderful study, not necessarily because I've been teaching it, but the information has been uh, eye-opening uh, and encouraging for us, right? So uh, I wanna review several lessons that I think we've learned as a result of this study. So. So ladies and gentlemen, the, the, pur the purpose of this is not necessarily for you to just listen to me talk about it, for you to retain it and to be able to discuss it and to share it, right? Uh, I know my, my teaching style is a little different. It, it tends to be more of a monologue, but the intention is this is this is a didactic moment that that you would that you would be able to use the information and to be able to engage in discussions with it right uh, to get over your fear of being wrong right of saying something wrong get past that at least engage in a discussion all right so so here's what we learn again for those persons who are new who are joining us who are watching this on all of our platforms, um, uh, you probably should go back and read the book, The Bible is Black History. Uh, prepare to join us in July when the author of the book will be with us at St. Matthew, <coughs> Reverend Dr. Theron Williams. She's gonna preach per Sunday morning. And then we're gonna have two days of teaching, Monday and Tuesday. Y'all will be back from whatever 4th of July travel you going on. That's why he's coming that first Sunday in July. And then the next two nights in person, we will uh, have an online option, uh, but, but we're gonna have two nights of teaching with Dr. Williams, the author of this book, and he has written several others, all right? So here's what I think we've learned and I wanna hear your thoughts about it at the end as well, all right? Number one, I think we've learned in this study that the Bible is a historical repository of African black history, all right? So if you started this study having no sense that the Bible was not a story of black history, was not a story of African history, hopefully we have refuted that in this study using the Bible itself, right? Uh, we have uh, looked at other, uh, what's called extra biblical literature, uh, stuff outside of the Bible that confirms what's already in the Bible. Because listen, listen, because the Bible, listen, the Bible does not tell us everything about everything, all right? And, and, and we've grown up with a whole lot of myths and a whole lot of information we just think that, you know, everything we need to know is in the Bible. Well, that's true in one way, but the Bible doesn't give us all of the African history stuff that we need, but it certainly cannot be discounted when we're talking about uh, the development of African history, all right, and particularly uh, African religious history, all right. Number two, connected with this. I'm on page one in the middle of your outline. There is no way that any reasonable person can deny the African presence in the Bible. There's no way that any reasonable person can deny the African presence in the Bible. The geography speaks for itself. And we started looking at the geographical realities from Genesis, from the Garden of Eden, right? We laid out so many and pointed to so many countries that are named in the Bible, right? So there's no way any reasonable person can deny the African presence in the, in the Bible. No reasonable person. Now we got a lot of unreasonable people that we deal with, right? A lot of people who don't even want to hear this. Their mind will not 
allow them to consider <laughs> that the Bible is an African-based book. It's not all their fault because that's not how we were trained. That's not how we were brought up in the context of the church. All right. But anybody who has uh who 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 is open to thinking, right, and to considering information cannot deny that. All right. Thirdly, we learn. And I don't know that we got an answer to this. Number three, we learned that we need to be clear about what the word black means when discern when discussing the people and nations in the Bible. What 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 does black mean? Right? Are we talking about skin color? Are we talking about culture? Are we talking about people who have gen a genetic connection to Africa? So. I think we kind of we kind of know, right, what we mean, but I don't know that we have clearly and succinctly, and, and you all highlight and circle and star this so that when Dr. Williams comes in July, we can press him about what he means by black history. You know, note he used the word black history, not necessarily African history in the Bible. All right. Note that. All right. So I don't know that we really got a definition of that in this study. All right. And that's a, a question that uh, Brother McGinnis raised last week that I brought up. OK, number four. And this is just a, a point that I push all the time. We must not just read the Bible or meditate on the Bible. We must study the Bible. Right. We must study the Bible. and and and. Again, my 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 sense is that many of us, as long as we may or may not have been in the church, don't have a history of studying the Bible. We have a history of reading it. We have a history of meditating on it. You know, when somebody is going through, uh, uh, when somebody is going through an issue, um, we want to know. You know, folk will call me up. Give me a scripture. <laughs> right. G give, give me give me a scripture to deal with that. Well, no, it's, it's not always that simple for me to just give you a scripture. All right. Based on what you're going through. All right. I want you persons who participate in, in our Bible studies. I want you to come to love to study the Bible. There will be times when we can just read it. There will be times when we can just meditate on it. I want you to love so that any time you hear somebody in teaching or preaching, when they take a text that, you, that, that maybe you can't do it right at that moment, but you will learn and come to love to study it, not just to hear it, right? Not just to hear it, but to dig deep into what the text is saying, all right? So we've learned that. Number five. We have learned, and we were talking about this a little bit tonight, that the Bible has been interpreted and used to support and justify the oppression of people of color in every arena of life. The corruption has been massive. There is no area in African historical development that inculcated the use of the Bible where the Bible has not been used to justify oppression, particularly in those New Testament letters that talk about slavery, right? That, that, that lift up slavery kind of as a good thing. And, that, and the development of a slave narrative and a slavery controlled system permeates education, permeates history, permeates economics, permeates spirituality, right? And many of us, as we talked about uh, the imagery, I'm getting ahead of myself, but, but imagery and what we see and what we have seen of depictions of God and Jesus, the pictures, even, even as we get ready to start Lent, and we'll and we'll for the 99th time watch the Ten Commandments, right? And you know, th th those though, you know, in the very interesting though, I, I've always found it interesting that they run the Ten Commandments 
uh, during Lent and uh, leading up to Resurrection Sunday. You do know that they don't necessarily do that for the Christian perspective. They do that for the Passover perspective. They do that for the Jewish support, not the Christian support. All right. Anyway, the Bible has been used to justify and support oppression of people of color. All right. Here's the thing, too. Number six, many people of color use the Bible to justify and support their own oppression. All right. There are a whole lot of us who have not been liberated. Whole lot of us who, who don't see it. Whole lot of us don't get it, <laughs> right? Whole lot of us don't get it because we are so stuck in what we've been taught, what we've been trained, what we're accustomed to, what we've been exposed to, all right? Number seven, I already mentioned it. Imagery is everything, right? Pictures relate, imagery is everything. If we don't see pictures of the prophets, if we don't see pictures of Jesus, if we don't see pictures of biblical characters who look like us, you know, what is the saying we, we reviewed? If you can see it, you can be, it, right? The reason many of us have issues making this switch is because historically we haven't seen people in the Bible to look like us. Charlton Heston, you know, doesn't really look like us, right? So, so all of those biblical stories that we've seen depicted in movies do not have uh, necessarily people of color, right? And some of us even feel some kind of way about saying, it. you know, there's just, we're just unsure about it, right? But we have learned in this study that this is an African-based narrative, all right? Number eight, I give you a little diagram. When it comes to uh, how the world functions and even how it relates in biblical principle, it's all about the Benjamins, right? <laughs> it's all about the Benjamins, meaning that economies thrive because of the free labor given by people of color. And this is why I keep trying to tell our young people that I need y'all to help me tell them again and again and again and again and again. There is no area of life that we exist in right now where uh, people of color may have a relationship to, but, but white Europeans and others control economic systems it's all about the Benjamins. When Reverend Donna was talking earlier about the economics, uh, uh, you know, about banking, you know, there are more people of color in this country than a little bit. How come we don't have thriving black financial institutions? And 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 the and when listen and watch how the system works. Whenever there is a thriving financial institution. Whenever there is a thriving financial institution, the system tries to shut it down. I gave you examples, even today, of Byron Allen, Byron Allen who, who uh, owns the Weather Channel, right? A uh, media mogul trying to buy up everything. He, he, he comes in, uh, uh, he runs into such interference because he got just as much money as these media companies do, right? So it's all about the Benjamins, right? It's all about, it's all about, and, and whoever controls the economic system controls the narrative, all right? Pastor, so, can, I just say, can I just say something? Yes. I, I, and, and I do feel that, you know, someone wrote the other day about, if Donald Trump wins, that's that will be the last of America as we know it, or something like that. But I really do believe this is what uh, this is all pointing to. They want to bring us back to where we used to be, so that they can have free labor. And uh, you know, uh, uh, 
They, they want free labor. They want everything free. They want us to go back. And when I say go back, I mean before 1960. They want us to go way back there because things were better. They didn't have to pay us. They kept their monies to themselves. All they had to do was give us a little bit that wouldn't hurt their pocket as slaves. So, I, you know, I'm very passionate about this when it comes on to voting. We need to go out and vote. I'm sorry, Pastor. Well, that's okay. Well, like I said Sunday, Reverend, Reverend Dr. Donna and everybody, like I said Sunday and I keep saying, Voter registration is important, listen, but voter education is more important. Voter education, right? We Because if we just rely on what we hear on the news and what we're reading on the internet, uh, you know, it, it is beyond being why some people think the way they think, but they are grabbing their information from sound bites on the news and off of the internet. But here's the real thing, and I'll, and I'll leave this alone, because I don't know who is on here. I don't know who's listening to this. I don't know what people believe, right? The reality is that what the former president's strong suit has been, what he has done an excellent job of, is sowing fear into the system. Fear. Right. Uh, if you ever listen to some of his past comments, he'll say uh, they are coming. If you are not careful, they are going to take your country from you. Right. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. Uh, I don't know how many of you all were in church or logged on Sunday to uh, Dr. Stephanie James Harris, but she really raised a couple of points that has been lost in the migrant narrative. Right. She we we actually listen. And, and I know people feel all kinds of way about this, but we actually as a religious institution have a responsibility to the migrant. We have a responsibility to the immigrant. Right. We have a, because you know what? You know what? We migrants. This this is not home country. If, if you really want to reach it back to the time we're talking about, right? We, we migrants, we, we didn't ask to come. We were forced to come. That's why I keep saying that, that we have to make sure we're using our languages. The colonializers didn't capture slaves and bring them here. They captured free people and turned them into slaves. All right. They were not slaves when they were captured. All right. So uh, at the end of the day, it's all about the money. Right. And that's in every institution, including the church. All right. Number nine, we cannot rely on the broader educational systems to teach us about ourselves and our history. This can even be true when it comes to the church. We can't we can't expect. Listen, the oppressor isn't going to empower the oppressed. So that's why we got to have these sessions where we study. And when we go to trusted sources uh, who provide trusted information about the reality of our history and the fact that we don't hear the history in the broader context doesn't mean it's not real. This is really the problem all of us should be having with this whole book banning thing uh, and the the. Uh, uh, school systems unwillingness to teach African history. The fact that you don't teach it don't mean it didn't happen. And, the, and you don't want to feel bad about it. You don't want your children to feel bad about it. Please. We also learn number 10, the broader community will, for the most part, deny the importance and or existence of this history. So we already know that we're rolling the rock up here. We already know that uh, the systems, uh, the systems will not receive this information. 
we already know that when you go to the uh, the Valentine party tomorrow night and the next birthday party and the Christmas party, and you start talking about stuff, we all, you already know people ain't going to hear it. They're going to walk away from you if this comes up. All right. They don't want to hear this because this is not real. All right. Number 11, we learned that being black is not a curse. We were not cursed black. We were born black. Right. And the truth of the matter is the black of the berry, the sweet of the juice. So those of you who are who are who are very, very dark and you've been trying to use uh, ointments and things to lighten your skin. The devil is alive. You you all you all live in your blackness. If blackness wasn't so bad, was so bad, what wouldn't be laying out on the beach uh, catching cancer and melanoma trying to color their skin if it were so bad? All right. So so we, we have to have a sense of pride in our own blackness. Number 12, we don't know why God has not intervened in history and changed how things are. So, so the question somebody is quickly to ask, well, why hasn't God changed all this? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> why hasn't God intervened? in history and change the hearts and minds of people who run these systems. Don't know. We learned that. Top of page two, we must continue to teach the truth and be true to who we are as people of African descent. I am in a minority, I'm sure. Uh, I could easily, uh, you know, give you the kind of milk toast version of Bible study. And, you know, make everybody feel good and, you know, give you 12 steps to this and how did it, how they be, you know, 12 steps to holiness and, you know, do this, do this. No, that's not where we are. We are in a struggle for our spiritual lives. So we have to be true to who we are as people of African descent. And if you are uncomfortable with that, if you are uncomfortable with who you are as a person, you got larger issues beyond what this Bible study can do for you. All right. Uh, we are people of African descent. And we have to be true to who we are, warts and all. I would challenge you to ask yourself, what have you learned from this study? All right. What, what has this done for you? I really would like to hear that. But let me close by asking you to consider what the next steps are. All right. Uh, hopefully all of us are going to go to uh, www.bibleisblackhistory.com and sign up for the Institute. If you don't want to do that yet or you want to wait till uh, Reverend Dr. Williams comes in July uh, to sign up to do further study in this area, uh, I would encourage you to do that. Tomorrow is Ash Wednesday, uh, inviting you to join us in worship. Uh, the flyer is attached with the connection um, uh, to our service tomorrow night. It'll be on all of our platforms, Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, as well as our streaming connection. Next Tuesday, so we're ending this study tonight. Next Tuesday, we begin the next Bible study that will take us through the six weeks of Lent. Uh, it is based on the book, Plenty Good Room a Lenten Bible study based on African-American spirituals. So we're going to do six weeks of study based on African-American spirituals. Uh, there was a line out the bookstore down the hall Sunday uh, to get the books, both this book and the devotional book. That's a great sign. If you didn't get your book, uh, they'll still be there. Uh, the distant members books will be mailed out tomorrow since the office was closed today. Uh, but you should have it in time for next week. Just make sure uh, you have sent in uh, the money for the books. Uh, and the, the Lenten devotional books are here as well. For those who were there, you were able to pick them up. I'm asking you, ladies and gentlemen, I am really serious about helping us to develop uh, a love for Bible study, right? a love for it, a love for it, not just reading it, but having a love for Bible study. And uh, I think we uh, tried to stay focused and stay dutiful to our intention to deal with these matters, not only biblically, but socially. 
uh, and also to uh, include other relevant points uh, to help us to have better clarity about understanding uh, this information. So before we close, uh, I'll hear one or two of you with any comments, anything you wanna share about what you may have learned from this study, uh, how you feel about it, uh, just any comments you wanna make as we conclude uh, the Bible is Black History uh, section. It's Karen Cooper. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, Pastor, I have to apologize for interrupting you when you were listing the Black banks, and I immediately jumped in Carver because when you mentioned Harlem, that hits close to home. Um, there is another Black bank for Blacks and Latino. It's Greenwood. It comes out of Atlanta, Georgia. So we did, we, I, and that one still exists. So we did have Carver and we did have Freedom Bank, but I just wanted to bring the Greenwood uh, Bank to our attention. It comes out of Atlanta, it's from Andrew Young and anyone that wants to Google it for detailed information. But the bigger issue, Sister Cooper, is that we can list and, and enumerate the number of black banks on one hand, maybe True. two. You True. deal with all of the financial institutions in this country, how come we can't name more than five or six black banks? That's a problem. That's the that's the very point. You're perfectly the, you're perfectly correct because when I Googled um, Greenwood, Chase came up first, mm -hmm. just like you had mentioned prior too. But then I mm -hmm. went into Greenwood Black Bank, and then it came forward with a little bit more detail. But you're perfectly correct, Reverend MJ. Pastor, good evening, everyone. Um, I think as go going through the book, the, the summary that he gave on page 155, uh, uh, he said, when the Black community, I underline this and I love it, when the Black community finally figures out that it is among the chosen people of God, mm -hmm. not necessarily because of a lineage connection to the biblical Abraham, but because God chose the Black race as the medium through which to reveal himself to the world and claim it as such and repent, returning to the Lord, then and only then will God restore their fortunes. And then he goes on the next paragraph to say, if my people who are called by na my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn them from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. We got a lot to claim back. So, you know, I'm excited. I, I am too. <laughs> as long as we can get, listen, we're not going to get everybody on the same page, right? But if we can get enough people on the same page, we can do some mighty, mighty things. And the difficulty has always been with our people that, uh, and, and the system uses divide and conquer, divide and conquer, right? We cannot get enough of us to stay together, to be focused. We end up dealing with, okay, who's going to be in charge? Who's going to get the name recognition? Who's going to, you know, who's going to be uh, speaking at the mic, all right? All of those things become our focus, you know, and we miss the bigger picture. I just, you know, I, I just really don't know what we can do to change that. Even when you deal with Black civil rights organizations, right? In theory, in theory, we have five or six Black-based civil rights organizations. Most of us probably don't know what they they individually do or what they individually focus on. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Why can't we kind of bring everybody together and focus on, you know, those things which are critically important? Now, in fairness, though, in fairness, we got so many things. <laughs> that we need to be dealing with, it becomes overwhelming. Education is important. Prison industrial complex is important. Financial, financial issues are important. Employment is important. There are so many things that have so many sub themes and sub particles to it. It becomes difficult for anybody to really focus on any one thing. 
poverty is. I mean, there's just so many. We could make a list all night. Right. One thing, but, one thing at a time. Yeah. But 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 you know, if 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 everybody can make an agreement to focus and come together and not allow personality <laughs> or or uh you know personal stuff to get in the way, uh, we might be able to move in a certain direction. Because black people are quick to talk about, well, I don't want to do that. And when you say, well, well, why? I don't know. I just don't want to do that. But no, what that really means is I don't want to do it with you. <laughs> All right. I don't, I don't, I don't want to listen to you. I'm not going to follow you to do it. Now, somebody else come and propose the same thing. They'll be willing to do it. That's what usually it means. That's where personality steps in. We, 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 we treasure personality over principle. Right. So we got to move to that point. Anybody else? Anything you've learned as a result of this study? Y'all ain't learned nothing. You mean we've been talking for three, four months. Ain't nobody learned nothing. Pastor. Yes, go ahead. What what um what has the um AME church said about the um immigrant issue? I wanna say that I've seen one press release about it. Mm. I want to say, I'd have to go back and look, but nothing of significance. Uh, uh, I know a lot of us individually have been supporting, um, well, we've said a lot about the ceasefire stuff between Israel and Gaza. But nothing of significance that I can recall right now where the institutional church has said something about the immigrant crisis. Okay. All right, Brother Randy? Um, I'm tremendously encouraged. Uh, there were revelations from this material, but to be able to look at the Bible and to see us as the chosen people, that's tremendous. So it's a blessing to, to have the revelations, to have mask mm -hmm. off. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a new revelation and a new day. Just like that can change a perspective because I won't front. I used to read the Bible and think, okay, it's a chosen people. Favor ain't fair. Well, I'm, I'm thankful I have favor regardless, but who is this that you supposedly got favor over me? Do I even believe? But that, it's us. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you know, mask off. So that's a revelation that I didn't know before. And on top of that, with perspective, when we realize, wow, we are made in his image. And according to the measure of our faith and what he can do, he's placed it in us. So I'm tremendously encouraged that we can as we step into realization in the moment today, not even just looking off in the future or in the past, but understanding that that belief that in the empowerment, the delegated authority, the made in his image, that everything that is ours to claim, we have to realize, he said, we have to believe it. And that's a big thing. We didn't believe it was us. We didn't believe that we could do what he said we could do. So it's a new day. I'm just encouraged by the information that's shared and also by the perspective that I'm gaining mm -hmm. uh, with who we are and what we can do with what we've been given. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Praise God. Thank you for that. And at the same time, at the same time, Brother Rand and everybody, as we celebrate that, we got to also realize the pushback that will come because of our revelation, right? We got to balance, you know, we have had the revelation, but everybody around us ain't had the revelation, right? Right, right. right. But as we step into that revelation, pushback or not, when we, what do we have? Look what we got. I so I got we, we, we embrace that? Ooh, let it, let them come. It doesn't matter. Sure, when, sure. when we when we really it it 
understand what we have? It's, it's, it's not just that we were the chosen people, but as a believer, what we've been gifted with, right. all manner of sickness, signs and wonders following us. That's us. Yeah. We, we, I don't, I didn't know that yesterday. I mean, sure. we've heard it, but have we thought it, walked in the room and out of the room, believing it? That's a different thing. That's who we are from the beginning of the book to the end. Everybody in between. That's us. That's us. That's us in the book. That's that's the revelation. And, and yeah, and heaven on earth, not tomorrow. It's now. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take Pastor, one more. Go ahead. Pastor, what I really, really admire about what the book was telling us about ourselves, and it's a whole lot. But one thing I, it says, the black church must continuously educate God's people about their unique place in God's ever unfolding eternal plan. And that's what we need. We need more and more education about ourselves and about the black, the black history of, of, of the church because it's deep, it's deeper than, than we think. And the more we know, the better. The more we know, the closer and closer we get to God. It's, it's everlasting. It's everlasting. Thank you. I've always, always said, Sister Christine, that the Black church is going to be the salvation of this country. The Black yes. church. That's why I really don't want, I, I really want to encourage our people to 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 not to stop taking the church for granted to not yes. to not just see the church as a building where we mm -hmm. show up up for 90 minutes on Sunday and maybe mm -hmm. come out once or twice during the week and connect no this institution is meaningful and powerful and we yes. have we have the opportunity to change uh change uh, where we are. We may not be able to change the world, but we can change where we are and we can yes. impact, we can affect change in our community. And that's yes. why I'm passionate about what we do for Christ. Yeah, only what we do for Christ will last. We know all that. We can run all the cliches, but we got mm -hmm. to actually do something to make mm -hmm. a difference in the places where we are. All right. Yes. Yes. Do something where we are, and it's a and there's a lot of uh, usually when I'm teaching ministers who are entering the ministry in the AME Church, uh, and and folk who go to pastor a church for the first time, I'll say to them, it's going to take you uh, five to seven years to become the pastor of the church, and all mm -hmm. of them look at me and say, "What do you mean? I mean, mm -hmm. my name is." I said, well, no, no, your name being on the appointment doesn't mean you're the pastor of the church. Because once mm -hmm. you get there, once you get there, you're going to spend uh, two or three years assessing what you have. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to spend another two or three years deprogramming people. Then you're going to spend another two or three years reprogramming people. So mm -hmm. around about seven Year eight is when you become the pastor in people's mm -hmm. heads, in people's hearts, and in their minds, right? So I'm yeah. I'm going yeah. on year six. I, I might be the pastor by 2025, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that, yeah. that's when I'll become the pastor in your hearts and in your minds, right? But it mm -hmm. takes that mm -hmm. long to really mm -hmm. to really figure out what you're dealing with, because you got a whole lot of historical stuff, a whole lot of mm -hmm. church hurt whole lot of stuff people been through, a whole lot of experiences mm -hmm. people have that don't even have nothing to do with the church, that they bring to the church. So you're dealing with mm -hmm. a collection of emotions and thoughts and feelings and folk are trying to figure out what they feel and da 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 da, -da right? So, so yeah. this whole process of education in the church, which is so critically important, has to be something that we are focused on. So these teaching mm -hmm. moments, these teaching opportunities are very serious, but it will be the black church. You mark my words. It will be the mm -hmm. black church that saves 
our country and saves our spiritual communities as well. That's my belief. Yes. Amen. Yes. All right. All right. So let me thank yes. everyone for your presence tonight. Please read uh, the first chapter uh, in the uh, in the book for next week. Um, just read the first chapter. Wait a minute. Read the uh, lesson one. Every time I feel the spirit, a mountaintop experience. That's in the book. Plenty good room. Uh, please read that. That will be our discussion next week. Hopefully, you join us in uh, Lenten Ash Wednesday worship tomorrow night. And uh, let's continue to open up our hearts and our minds to what God has to say to us. All right. Uh, Reverend uh, MJ, would you please close us out? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we've been able to come together one more time, Lord, not only to read your word, but to study your word. Lord, we thank you for Reverend Dr. Donna, who, who led us in Bible study, and we thank you for our pastor, Reverend Melvin E. Wilson, who continues to lead and guide us and direct us into how to study the Bible and learn more. Lord, we, we thank, we're thankful for the Blackness that we are, and Lord, we just ask that you would continue to help us to learn more, Lord, about what that means, Lord, and then, Lord, give us the faith and the strength to do something about it. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for every family represented in this in this Bible study, Lord, and everyone that's on the line. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.